What about close kind of competitors? I don't know if you would put it that way, but if you look in the space of ideas, uh, competitor cryptocurrencies like Polkadot, yeah. what are some interesting difference between Cardano and Polkadot? Technically, philosophically, historically, is that something you think about when you think about the future of Cardano? Yeah. I mean, we do. We actually have a whole group of people that do business intelligence and comparative analysis. And uh, we're getting to a point where we want to start eventually forking their code and running private versions of it, and just playing around with things. Well, that's and getting better. It's, 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 it, Consensus actually does this. They actually did it with EOS. And they wrote this lovely report, like trashing EOS, saying, hey, by the way, all those claims these guys made are just not true. Uh, but, you know, it's nice to do that. It's nice to use your competitor's technology or, you know, competing protocol technology because you learn a lot along the process. It's not all bad. You know, there's always something there because they have different trade-offs and customers that potentially are more interesting. Like right now we're grokking, how do we want to do the sidechain model of Cardano? Polkadot's actually a tremendously useful piece of infrastructure for that conversation because they copied part of our infrastructure. You know, well, Gavin's a trained computer scientist. He got his PhD from uh, York and he read our papers, obviously. And he realized that Ouroboros was a really good starting place for building a proof of stake system. So Polkadot's consensus is very similar to ours. And so if you're saying, hey, how do you do a good sidechain model with proof, an Ouroboros style proof of stake? Well, we already have this parachain thing, right? And so, so now I, by just looking at that, I can kind of get an idea of how one way of doing it. And so that's just beautiful that we live in a space where that's there, it's open source. And if it's really good, you just say, okay, well, we'll just take that and adopt that. There's no shame, you know? Um, the other side of it is that um, Polkadot really has focused a lot on commercial adoption, Silicon Valley adoption, getting real use and utility. And I say in a much more sustainable way than Ethereum is focused on. Ethereum was kind of a spray and pray thing. Polkadot was more of like, hey, let's, let's go ahead and actually curate our ecosystem more carefully and we're going to build it in a way where there's predictable or as predictable a cost as possible with the rollout of the infrastructure. And, you know, that that's so important for a business. It's not necessarily important for an experiment or a startup where, you know, they're just trying to get population as quickly as possible. We'll figure out later. But if you're actually sitting here saying, I need to know what my expenses are three years, five years, 10 years into the future, you need predictability there. Mm -hmm. I think they have a better shot of it than anything in F2 or, um, or with currently Ethereum. Now, there, the big contrast between the two systems, though, is we actually have native multi-asset. We have a different accounting model. I think our base ledger is far more expressive. Our rate of evolution with proof of stake is much faster than theirs because they're based on derivative work and we already have Ouroboros Omega and other things there. And I think we have a better, ultimately, uh, a better sidechain model will come because we have something called Mithril for that. But we learned a lot from their work. Uh, the other thing is that we thought about governance a lot more carefully, in my view. And we have Catalyst and Voltaire. And really the key there is saying, how do we make sure that every single person who holds data can participate in the network? That wasn't a high design priority of Polkadot. It was more fast commercial adoption, the acquisition of customers. We'll come to governance later. And th those were just different business philosophies. But it's nice to have a competitor like that. And oftentimes I've said that Polkadot's like Ethereum 1.5. It's what F2 probably should have been. There was what Vitalik wanted to do, which was incredibly aggressive and brilliant, but it's a lot. And there's so much execution risk in that plan. And I think they've had like six years of playing around with it. Had they gone down the Polkadot road, uh, they probably would have been in market with it in 2018. And because they already had the network effect, uh, they would have had years of building on that, iterating that. And they already had a path to it too. All they had to do was just give Elaine Shee and her cohorts at Cornell, you know, a five, $10 million grant. Snow White would have been uh, the dominant protocol, not Ouroboros in the uh, proof of stake space. So it's really fascinating historically when you look at these things and the rivalries and what they did and what they didn't do. And, you know, <laughs> Gavin... Uh, had a chance to have C++ Ethereum be used as the uh, as IBM's enterprise blockchain. The only reason they didn't do it is, you know, it was licensed GPL. And I think they wanted to relicense Apache. Uh, if you ever talked to Bob Summerwall, he was there at the time and he had this amazing story about like these terrible fights where, you know, it's like, guys, just relicense the goddamn code. Let's figure out a way to make this happen so that we can, you know, get this huge network effect of, of being basically IBM's play. Mm -hmm. They didn't do it. They created Fabric you know, these types of things. Uh, so there's uh, there's a lot of lore and stories in that respect. But the space is better because of Polkadot. 
And there's a lot of good people there. Web3 is a good concept. And, you know, we run into their people in Germany and Zurich a lot. And they've always been cordial and friendly and you know, really affable. 